Okay, one thing we're going to talk about now, we're going to finish this up with vegetable varieties. My name is Tom Kalb. I'm extension horticulturist. I focus my attention more in the western half of the state. We're talking about vegetable varieties. Why that? Because one of the keys to success to vegetable gardening is to start with a good variety. If you've got a good variety, you can find something that will yield abundantly, will help fight diseases naturally without fungicides, and give you amazing flavors to your dinner table. On the other hand, if you pick a lousy variety, it doesn't matter how much work you put in improving the soil or weeding, watering, you can still have frustration and poor results. So choose a good variety. Now, how do you pick a good variety? That's a good question. I tell you, for me, a lot of us start with seed catalogs. And when I was a kid, I was still am quite the nerd. I love seed catalogs. You know, other kids read comic books. Man, not me. I like seed catalogs. They were so cool. I just love to get them in the mail in the springtime, fill with colorful pictures. But the problem with seed catalogs is everything's good in a seed catalog. How do you make a choice? They say everything's great. So then a bunch of uh, horticulturists come together and develop this All-America Selections Program. So they look at the new varieties and they give awards to ones that are innovative and widely adapted. But the problem is I don't care about what's good in Georgia, North Carolina, Missouri, or California. I care about North Dakota. North Dakota, hey man, it's snowing right now in April here in Fargo. This is the harshest place in the United States to live, I think. We can't even beg people to come up here and we promise them jobs. It's, so it's hard for people, it's hard for plants. I want to know what goes good in North Dakota, not necessarily the rest of America. The AAS program is okay, but I want more specific information. Okay, so that's what the university is here for. NDSU, we can have research information that's based on our state, but still that. I want to know what the best varieties for gardens in our state. Not the best varieties in the state that perform at research stations. So then we got to bring it home more towards personal experience. And this is a this is a valuable tool. You know, find out what works best in your garden. And for me, I've got a research team in my home garden. This is Tom, Jr. and Maria, they're doing a very sophisticated test. We call it the tongue test. And to identify a good variety, the variety has to ripen before the kids can catch snowflakes on their tongues. Okay, so that's mid-September in Bismarck. <laughs> but now what if we had not just one garden team, but if we had a hundred gardeners across the state testing vegetables? Or what if we had like 200 or even more families testing in their own backyards. Well, that's what we've got with the North Dakota Home Garden Variety Trials. We've got a team and we've reached out to 500, more than 500 households in North Dakota testing varieties in their own backyard. And a lot of you have this publication about recommended vegetable varieties for North Dakota gardens. This is the output of researchers here in our state Backyard researchers here in North Dakota. These are the varieties that have performed well in our state under real garden conditions. And you are, and you see the website at the bottom there. You are, we've got a web page. You see that potato thing there? That's our seed catalog for this year. We're offering 55 different types of vegetables, herbs, and cut flowers that you can test in your own backyard. And a lot of you have this, you should have this handout. This is our brochure. You can order from the brochure or you can go to our catalog and we even have online ordering. You can order that. The way it works is we have side-by-side -side testing. And I'll just give an example. For example, this year there's a new kale that came out. Okay, a dinosaur kale. You know, kale, maybe not the favorite vegetable of North Dakota or anywhere for that matter. But the finest kale, so to say, it comes from the Italian Tuscany region. And La Senado is the most popular kale. But there's a new variety out there called Black Magic. So which one's better, Black Magic or La Senado? Well, that's one of the trials we're going to be doing this year to test which, which of those two is better. And there's a new cantaloupe out this year called Duchess. It's supposed to be super sweet and early. 
perfect for us, is it? I don't know. Let's test it for real and see how it performs in North Dakota. So we'll test that against a standard cantaloupe variety. So here's an example of an evaluation form. And you have this as a handout as well. You can see it's, it's quite straightforward. It's, actually, we've got over 200 kids every year work with us on this project. So it's a good kids project, too. And so in this trial, is a mock trial here. We have Apollo against Zeus. And if you look at the left-hand column, we have simple questions. Which one germ and I know you probably can't see this on the slide, but if you look at your handout, which one germinated best? Which one was healthier? Which produced the first ripe melon? Which was higher yielding? Which was more attractive? And which tasted better? So you just got to check off that. And then we, the bottom line is we want to know which ones do you recommend? Okay, which ones do you recommend and you prefer? So we'll have 20 or more families doing this test. They'll send all of these sheets to me in the fall after the frost, and that will lead to our publication of the North Dakota Home Garden Variety Trial. That's our results. You see there on the left, that's a, a, actually a, we put the gardener comments in there. We got a 127-page publication there that you can download, or if that's just too much good stuff, you can't deal with it, we have a summary there. And actually, if you're a participant, we do give you a copy of the summary so you can see how your trial compared with other trials across the state. And then, of course, this is a great public good that these families are doing for the entire state so they get a certificate of recognition as well. So you've got the brochure in front of you, and, this, and you can go to our website and check out the catalog. I strongly encourage you to, to think about it. So it's fun. It's easy and fun. And most people continue. I've had many people who have been on this project for over six years and running. And 98% of the gardeners are introduced to new varieties, and the other 2% are lying about it because they are introduced. I'm sure they're introduced to new varieties. And about 85% or, or more report higher yields because they're in the project and also have improved diets because they're involved in the project. They just want to spend more time out in the garden because they know it's a research thing going on. So it's a fun project. Now let's talk about some of the winners tonight. That's what I want to focus on, the winners. <clears throat> a lot of times I show this slide and gardeners look at this. I ask them what it is, and you can just guess for yourself what it might be. It's kind of it's hard to hear across the state what you're all saying, but there's a lot of cherry tomatoes out there, or current tomatoes. But that is wrong. This is asparagus. This is asparagus. And you may not know it, but there are male and female asparagus plants. This is a female because it produces berries. And the female plants, they live a very balanced life. They produce spears, but they also give a lot of their energy to producing seeds, these berries. Now, most of, most of us don't grow asparagus for berry production. We want spears, right? And so that's why, in this case, you want the men asparagus plants. You want the all-male boys from New Jersey, the Jersey boys, the Jersey boys is what you want. Jersey Giant, Jersey Knight, these are the ones that are going to give you a significantly higher yield because they don't waste their energy on producing berries. Okay, so go with the Jersey boys for asparagus. We do a lot of trials on beans, and pr pretty much uh, the, what happens is people say they like the beans, but not many people go crazy about the beans. And we're looking for people to go crazy and love the stuff. Bush Blue Lake 274 is the standard in home gardening, and Provider is probably the most reliable variety. But if you want something special, and that's what I want, I encourage you to try filet beans. So this is Maxi Bell. This is the type of bean that gets gardeners excited. Straight, slender pods, deep green, seven inches long, very flavorful. Maxi Bell, that is a great bean. I encourage you to give it a shot this year. Yard long bean, I don't know if that's showing on my slide here. Okay, good. It's, you guys are seeing it. That's all that matters. Okay, yard long bean. We can grow yard long beans in North Dakota. Yes, we can grow them in Minot, everywhere. The beans really do grow 24, 36 inches. It's amazing. And grow them on a trellis. And then what I do is I just tell my kid, little Tommy, I say, hey, Tom, you only have to have one bean for dinner tonight. No <laughs> Okay? They taste a little bit like asparagus. So 
So some people like that, some people don't. But it's fun and it's a beautiful plant. Carrots. Do a lot of trials for carrots in our North Dakota soils. The Nantes types generally are best for us. And the best Nantes, the Scarlet Nantes, is the standard, but for the highest uniformity and quality, Laguna or Nelson are the best. They're the sweetest and the highest quality. As far as, there's also Chantenay types on the far right there. These are like those big clubs that you can grow and they bop the rabbits over the head or trying to get your garden, you know. Chantenay carrots. Actually, they're used a lot for people who store their carrots over winter and also if you're growing carrots for bulk, like for juicing. Um, Hercules came out a couple years ago. It is an amazing variety. It just dominates all the others. Now you're starting to wonder, gosh, Tom, I never heard about most of these things. Where the heck am I going to get them? So on the back page of that recommended vegetable variety guide you got there, we have a list of seed companies, okay? And they all offer free seed catalogs. Beautiful. So tonight, you know, you're going to be so inspired by this presentation tonight, or maybe, to, maybe this weekend, you can go online, go to their website, and request their free catalogs. And one week later, when the snow starts, stops fall, falling, you can order your seed. So there's a lot of outstanding seed companies that give you all kinds of quality choices out there beyond what you get in your local hardware store. And these are all free, remember. 30 minutes on the internet, you're going to have 30 catalogs, even more. Let's talk about sweet corn. We do trials on sweet corn. There's four major types. The first one is the normal sugary type. This is the type that we were brought up as kids. And I, you know, I remember we had 10 or 15 acres of this one in Minnesota where I was raised. And when we picked corn, we knew that the instant we pulled it off the stock, the sugar content would start dropping. So I had to sell all that corn at the Minneapolis farmer's market by the next day or then it goes to the cows, okay? So that's the thing about normal sugary corn. Then what happened several years ago is the industry got involved and they, you know, we like to ship our vegetables from Florida and Texas and stuff. So they developed super sweet types, also called the shrunken kernel types. These are the classic super sweets. And they are three times sweeter, three times sweeter, and they hold their sweetness for much longer, at least a week before they have an appreciable loss. Okay? Now the drawback with the super sweets is that they're kind of, they were kind of crunchy in the beginning, you know, kind of just too crisp, almost like break a couple of teeth off those things. And then also they're hard to grow. And especially for us in North Dakota, the, the shrunken kernel, they're so sweet, the kernels themselves, the seeds are shrunken. They don't have any vigor to them. And so you've got to plant them under perfect soil conditions. It's got to be a warm soil and it's got to be a moist soil. So you've got to wait till the end of May. You gotta wait till your Memorial Day planting along with your tomatoes. That's when you can plant your corn. Okay, so that's kind of, and you gotta isolate it from other sweet corns too. So there's a lot of issues with this. However, that being said, if I could just recommend you to try one sweet corn this year, our, our team would say try Extra Tender 277A. That's a more modern variety. It's not as crisp, instead it's tender, super sweet. This is one that you're just gonna rave about and your whole family's gonna love it. Extra tender, 277A. Okay, getting back to the four types of sweet corn, the, the, the normal and the shrunken, and so then what happened, people wanted a sweet corn that was easier to grow. So they did the sugary enhanced types, the SEs. These are very common, and for example, Trinity is a common variety you'll see at every, every hardware store, and it's a good one. It's good and early, and, and it's got a big seed, so it'll germinate in a cold soil. So the SE types, they're twice as sweet as the normal. Not, not super sweet, just, just, just very sweet, but they're easy to grow. And lastly, the last uh, stage now is people are going to what we call synergistic types, and, or augmented super sweets too. And these are SE types that just have a little bit of extra super sweet or shrunken kernel. So they're, they're, still, they're still fairly easy to grow and they're a little bit sweeter. And if I could just give you a heads up, Allure has done very well in our trials. Okay, so those are some of our corn varieties. Okay. 
cucumbers. One thing I learned when I came to North Dakota is we love our straight eights. Wow, we love them. We're a frugal people, and the seeds are cheap. You know, you can spend five dollars and plant cucumbers in the whole county, just about. And also, it can tolerate cool summer conditions, and that's what we have here. So it's a, it's done well. But if you want a quality cucumber, I would encourage you to try some of these new burpless types. Okay, this is tasty green. It's been around actually for quite a while, but it's much higher yielding and a much higher quality, and it's burpless compared to a straight eight. Okay, very productive. Our gardener team, you know, hundreds of gardeners, they love this variety. Another trend now for cucumbers is snacking cucumbers, ones that you put in your lunchbox. They only grow about, they, you pick them when they're young, about six inches long. And then this, this variety, Diva, it is almost seedless, it's burpless, smooth skin, almost no skin on it. A nice munching type of cucumber. You might want to give this one a try. Lettuce, in our lettuce trials, we've identified several superior types. We really like what we call summer crisp types. They have a nice crisp texture and they can take the heat. They won't bolt in the summertime. Nevada gets very high ratings and it's, if you like red leaves, its cousin called Sierra is another winner for North Dakota. This is a butterhead type, and the most prominent butterhead is called butter crunch. A lot of us have heard about butter crunch lettuce. That's been around a long time, and it always does well in our trials. That's every garden center has butter crunch lettuce. You can't go wrong with butter crunch lettuce. Most of our gardeners like trying new things. So romaine lettuce is very popular among our team, and green forest has a very uh, attractive dark green leaf and very uh, crisp texture, heat tolerant too. Okay, let's keep moving here. Melons, and this is, you know, I talked about Duchess in the beginning about a new melon. Here's the old, here's the best one for North Dakota today, Athena. And the key is we got to find a melon that ripens early, okay, because that snow starts coming soon. Athena's early and reliable, but may I invite you to try a different type of melon. You cannot grow honeydew melons on a regular basis, even if global warming is occurring over North Dakota slowly but surely. You still cannot really reliably grow a honeydew, so just forget about it. And try something that you can grow. This is a Galea type. It has like a tropical flavor. Our gardener team really likes this, and Arava is early reliable, and a nice melon to enjoy. Yeah, here's another one. If you can't, if, you know, like what did, what did uh, Harling say? If you can't grow a sedum, you really got problems. If you, I know melons are tough, but if everybody can grow a Korean melon, a Sun Jewel Korean melon. This is the earliest melon, super productive, so easy to grow, and it just slips off the vine when it's ripe. And one thing that's neat about it, when you cut it open, it's not orange. Instead, it has a white flesh, white. And if you close your eyes when you eat it, you'd swear you're eating a sweet pear. Nine out of ten of our gardeners who try it, we try it for about three years, we get about nine out of ten gardeners would recommend it to other gardeners in North Dakota. So this is really a fun one to try that you can be guaranteed success with. Peas. Okay, I'd say I personally, I hate peas. I, I just have bad scars and memories of peas. I come from a big family. I had ten brothers and sisters, and we used to freeze a lot of vegetables, a lot of peas. You know what? I have to say, I spend every 4th of July shelling peas. You, know, you, you go pick about 10, 15 bushels of peas. And then we spent the whole day shelling peas in the kitchen. And it just didn't make sense to me, you know. You, do, you pick all those peas, and at the end of the day, you get, like, one bowl of peas, and then you get, like, ten bushels of the shells there that the cows get to eat. And then in the meantime, I never saw fireworks. It was just, I just didn't, just didn't make sense to me as a kid. So I, hide, I highly recommend sugar snap peas. And this is the most popular variety in our trial, Sugar Ann. 
nice thing about sugar and is you can pick them. They'll be ready on the 4th of July. You can pick them, freeze them, and then go watch the fireworks. It's a beautiful thing. Okay. You know, we don't do a lot of research on peppers and tomatoes because we focus more on direct sown crops in our trials. But we, last year we did do some pepper research. I just want to give you a heads up about one variety that really um, jazzed up our gardening team. And that's Orange Blaze Sweet Bell Pepper. Orange Blaze. It is a brilliant orange color and it was very productive. Our gardeners, you know, they're just when you start seeing all the exclamation points of enthusiasm on the reports, then it really opens up your eyes. So Orange Blade, it's an All-America Selections winner too, but it really, really is an eye-catching pepper. This is my research team looking at a variety of pumpkin that is called Neon. <clears throat> okay, Neon. What is really cool about this is that, well, first of all, I just think it's great for kids to grow their own jack-o'-lanterns, right? And anybody can grow neon. You know how pumpkins take over the whole garden? Neon won't. It stays in place, a semi-bush type. And the other thing about neon is it does not turn orange. It starts orange and just gets bigger. So you'll see these orange pumpkins, pumpkins glowing all summer long. And so even like here, even like when it, when it, uh, we do the snowflake test in mid-September. We still got our Halloween pumpkin because it's ready weeks before the other varieties. It's because it's always orange. And our gardeners, especially up there in the North Country, they really were jazzed up about neon because it's early and so reliable. Give it a try. Bright orange pumpkin. Beautiful. Not too, not too small, just a perfect jack-o'-lantern size. Spinach, you got to find spinach that can take the heat. And our garden team generally prefers smooth leaf types. Olympia is outstanding. Olympia is the best one for North Dakota. Okay, zucchini. Here we go with zucchini. And trying to recommend a variety of zucchini, a lot of people roll their eyes at me. I can see it across the state right now. And they're all saying, who cares what variety you plant? Because no matter what, we're going to get too many zucchini. But to them, I, I, I have to say, I, you're not giving zucchini the respect it deserves. Okay? Well, why do we scoff at a vegetable that's productive? We should be celebrating it. The problem is not the zucchini. The problem is us. We just don't know what to do with them. So let me give you a couple ideas that I've developed over the years. First of all, and the best variety is spineless beauty. That's the best one. That always wins our trials because it's dark green and the vines are spineless, easy to pick. It has an open habit, easy to find the zucchini. Now what do we do with it? Let's say you miss that zucchini when you're supposed to pick it and you come by a few days later and you see it's like really big. Okay, I got a great idea. What we did as kids is you can make it into a boat, okay, like a canoe. You just carve it out and put a mask on it, and you can float it down the river, like a Viking ship. You know, there's, there's things, you can, I think there's great possibilities here about having races of zucchini down the Missouri River or here in Fargo down the Red River. It's a wonderful thing for kids. They love, or you can, if you don't want to do it, you can just play with it in the bathtub, you know, a little Viking ship zucchini. It works. Here's another one. Do you know about the legend of Montana Maggie? There's a true story. Montana Maggie, she was a she was a zucchini gardener, and uh, one day there was a bear in her backyard taking out cleaning out her bird feeder. Okay, so Maggie's in there in the kitchen, just kind of doing her thing, and all of a sudden she hears her dog is barking away. The dog's barking away at the bear. Get out of here! Get out of here! All this noise. So then Maggie. So what's that noise? So she gets out of the kitchen, goes to her deck, and she goes, oh my God, there's a bear there. You shoo bear, shoo, shoo. And the bear did not appreciate that. So the bear started coming right towards Maggie. And so there's Maggie running from the deck into her kitchen. And there's that bear right there. Oops. There's that bear right there coming at her. And she, Maggie's got the door closed with one hand. And the bear face right in front of her, and she's up reaching on that kitchen counter. Where's that knife? Where's that knife? Oh, she found her zucchini. 
Bang! That is the foul goes the bear. Bear ran away. So how about that for zucchini? You can not only eat it, but you can it can be good use for recreation and self-defense. What else are you looking for in your vegetable? Give that spineless beauty a try. True story. Uh, for, as far as winter squash goes, I encourage you to try Burgess. Winter uh, buttercup squash. Most most squash lovers will tell you that um, the buttercup squash is a very high quality winter squash, and it's actually originated in North Dakota. The Burgess or the the buttercup squashes. Burgess is very early and delicious and reliable. Okay, again with tomatoes, I just got a couple things to say about tomatoes. One is, uh, again, we don't do a lot of research on tomatoes, but the old standbys like Early Girl, Celebrity, um, Big Beef, and now we see a lot of mountain varieties out of North Carolina. The Mountain Fresh is a dominant variety, Mountain Fresh Plus for the Midwest. That's a good quality tomato. In general, when, when I look for tomatoes, I look for determinate vine types. Uh, deter there's indeterminate and determinate. Determinate have a more compact habit. Okay? You don't have to prune them. A determinate type has generally an earlier fruit set and a more concentrated fruit set. Now, the indeterminate types just keep growing. So you've got to prune an indeterminate type. Also, who cares about a long harvest window with tomatoes in North Carolina? It's impossible. Okay, because you get frost so soon. Like if I lived in Florida, I'd think about an indeterminate type. But that's just no that's just not gonna happen here. Okay? We need something that can ripen early and get as many tomatoes as possible early. And that's why a determinate vine type is usually the way to go. And also a determinate type, you don't have to trellis if you don't want to. Like this is Roma. Roma is the easiest to grow tomato, the easiest to grow. You don't have to trellis it, you just let it sprawl on the ground to get a bumper crop. Okay? One thing about heirloom tomatoes. A lot of people, you hear a lot about heirloom tomatoes, especially like in feed cows and stuff. Generally, I'm not a fan of heirlooms because there's a reason why heirlooms are heirlooms. It's like Today at Gina Fargo, I didn't take a horse and buggy. I took a car. We moved on. We made progress. Okay? Just real briefly. To me, growing an heirloom reminds me of when like, I was a nerdy kid reading my comic books all the time and trying to date a really attractive woman. You know, no matter how hard I tried, I still was going to get my heart broken in the end. And the same with heirloom tomatoes. You know, you spend so much time on them. You get perfect spacing. You trellis them. You prune them. Uh, you make sure you never get their leaves wet because they'll get disease. And that's all that. You get a few crap tomatoes. I just don't get it. You're heartbroken. Now, that being said, those, you know, those few tomatoes can have a, a wonderful impact. They can just taste so delicious. You know, like that kiss on the cheek, I will never forget that kiss on the cheek before I got dumped. It was just <laughs> so wonderful. And seeing the heirloom tomato, like for me, like the first time I ate a stupid tomato from Czechoslovakia, that was just, um, I'll never forget that moment in my life when I ate that stupid tomato. It's so delicious. And it would be good on our trials last year, by the way. Um, but just, I would say, have low expectations with heirlooms. Should, you know, it's okay to grow them, you know. What did it say? It's good to, it's better to have love and loss than never to have loved at all. So give it a try. Okay. One, one thing that won't break your heart is Sweet Dakota Rose. This is the, num this is the best watermelon for North Dakota right here, Sweet Dakota Rose. It is reliable. It's, it's made in North Dakota. A lot of our gardeners will say, this is the best watermelon they've ever eaten. Sweet Dakota Rose. Give it a try. You won't be disappointed. My last thing I just got to throw in, it's, I always got to put in some herbs in the garden. Just love herbs. This is lemon basil. And like when I work in the garden, I just like to have a place in the garden where I can walk over and just kind of just get refreshed. And with lemon basil, if you never try it, you've got to try it. 
It is, it is so intense. You know, you just pick the leaf, stick it in your nose, and it is such a rush. And it is totally regal. It's wonderful. <laughs> Give basil a try, especially lemon basil. So how about, with that, Todd, are there any questions? Yes. <laughs> okay, let's go with it. Which cucumber variety? I'll do, okay, that's an easy one. Okay, the questions are, the question is, what's a good mildew-resistant cucumber that can grow on a trellis? You know, like that tasty green. Uh, sweeter yet, almost all the modern varieties resist mildew. It's just when you get to those heirlooms, we got issues. So stay away from the heirloom cubes. And again, I rep tasty greens a total winner. Sweeter yet, you know, sweeter yet gives you cucumbers in 48 days. It is so early and productive. Just go with the modern variety. And on a trell, everything will grow on a trellis. That trellis doesn't make a difference. That's great. The nice thing about trellis is your cucumbers will develop perfectly straight. That's the nice thing about a trellis. Yes? In this case, I never ate them. Next question. Is sun jewel more of a musk melon versus a watermelon? Sun jewel is a Korean melon. It's more like, if I, if I had to make it a cantaloupe or a watermelon, it's more like a cantaloupe. And the reason why I would say that is because a cantaloupe, you always know when it's ripe. You just give it a gentle tug and it'll come off. A watermelon is pretty much a guessing game. You got to look at the tendril. It's more like a guess. So it's not a watermelon. It's more like a, it's more like a cantaloupe. Where do you get these sweet corn varieties from? I get sweet corn varieties from. I get them from the seed catalogs you see right here. Yeah. And then I'll tell you one thing that we always pride ourselves on using untreated seed, but that is an issue with corn. You know, corn, there's a reason why farmers all use treated corn seed, because you get a much better stand. And this year in our trials, we're offering both treated and untreated corn seed. But, uh, yeah, you can get this. Almost every seed company will offer sweet corn seed. Are the melons you suggested a bush type or more like a vine? Okay. Every every melon I talk to, most things, they're a vine type. The question is, is, are these melons we talked about tonight, are they bush types or vine types? Okay, I'll tell you something about my checkered past. I was, I was in charge of the nation's biggest bush cantaloupe project when I was a graduate student at the University of Minnesota, and that's because we were pretty much the only one. And there's a reason for that. It just doesn't work. So forget a bush type nouns. Forget about it. They're all my type. Are gourds edible? Gourds are edible, but they're just not delicious. <laughs> <laughs> And also, so, you know, actually, especially, like, like, I lived in Asia for many years and did eat gourds, uh, but you got to pick them when they're very young and immature. Are any of the vegetables from NDSU GMO modified? Okay. You will, it's almost impossible. The question is about GMOs. For garden vegetables, it's almost impossible to find a GMO, okay? Just because, do you know how much millions of dollars it takes to produce? It's easy to produce a GMO. You can do that just like that. The problem is how do you get it on the market? It's got, it's got to go through, it's got to go through like years and years of testing, millions of dollars of testing, and no variety was worth it. So, so tomatoes, tomatoes, peppers, every common crop is not, not a GMO. There's, you will, you will get any normal seed catalogs, it will be 100% GMO free. Okay. So stay away from soybeans and, you know, field corn. Heirloom, heirloom tomatoes don't have the super taste I remember and desire. Other varieties I should try. High acid varieties, should I apply chicken manure to the soil to make it more acid, to get a more acid flavor? Okay, uh, will the soil type influence flavor? I think that's highly questionable um, as far as the scientific basis for that. Should you use chicken manure? Yeah, it's fine. Make sure it's rotted manure. Um, 
I just think, you know, you just have to just try a, a whole scope of different varieties of tomatoes and find what works out for you. What plants are not safe for dogs and cats? Okay, I would say anything that's a chocolate. <laughs> How would you know if it's a determinate versus an indeterminate? You read it on the label. Okay, but the real, okay, if it's really viney, it's indeterminate. It's on the label, though. An indeterminate keeps growing, a determinate, the vines terminate near a flower cluster. But it's always on the label, say, indeterminate, determinate, or semi determinate. Which of the cherry tomatoes do you recommend? Uh, which of the cherry tomatoes the most popular one is Super Sweet 100. It cracks a lot. That's right. Sweet, sweet Million was developed because it's less likely to crack. You know, but I, mean, I can't really speak. I don't really have a good professional research-based comment on that. I like uh, there's other ones that alter too, but but sweet. Sweet Super Sweet 100 is the most popular sweet chameleon, less likely to crack. Thank you for that. Okay. What is your take on GMO seeds, and is the corn in your seed in your trials non-GMO? Everything is non-GMO. I think it's, I don't, and I don't got time to tell you about my professional opinion about GMOs. Are neon pumpkin, pumpkins hybrids, or can I save and, and plant the seeds? Neon pumpkins are hybrids. We don't recommend you stay in the seed. Are there questions here in Fargo? Would you come up and ask it? This court only reaches about three feet. Your master bell, you talked about the master bell green. How about jade? Are they familiar? Jade, jade bean. Jade is another high quality bean. Um, we've tested that. Actually, we tested the new so called improved strain of jade last year against Bush Blue Lake 274. And it was kind of like a draw. Jade has a higher quality bean, but it's slightly less vigorous of a plant. So for me, I would go jade. It's a more typical bean, but the higher quality, more tender bean than Bush Brew Day 274. But it's not as skinny as let's say Maxibel would be. That's why you should try both. Yeah, how about moisture? You know, half the moisture is Maxibel. Okay. What about moisture? Jade, Jade you mentioned before, is not especially vigorous. It's kind of a wimpy plant, so my guess is be less drought tolerant. If you're looking for a heat or drought tolerant bean contender, is well respected for that. And again, also provider is almost foolproof. So they're standard green beans, bush beans. Any other questions out there? Well, Steve wants to know if you mention Garden Saturday. Steve wants to mention Garden Saturdays. Steve, no. Steve's out there. No, we're not going to mention it. <laughs> uh, Steve, why don't you type in what you want us to tell about Garden Saturday, and then we've got about 10 more minutes here, and uh, we can we'll, we'll say exactly what you want to say about it. Is it this Saturday, Steve? Is this Saturday? It's this Saturday. Okay, Steve's had a great event up in Grand Forks. It's, it's one of the mega events in the state as far as he has, he has lots of seminars there, lots of vendors there, and it's at the Alara Center now. He moved into the Alara Center, a nice facility. And I think Steve's got extremely high quality presentations from horticulture experts across the region. Really great presentation. I planted grape seeds and they are growing. Will they produce grapes? Okay, now we're okay. Now we're shifting gears here to fruits, right? Okay, grapes. Uh, will grape seeds produce grapes? Yeah, sure, but they'll probably die from winter for you know. Other grapes might get well. They're, they're not going to breed true to the variety. And so we got issues as far as the hardiness and the quality of the variety itself. So I would recommend that this person, I would, I would recommend this guy, unless you're breeding grapes for uh, fun and profit, and you're like, you want to be the next Elmer Swenson, keep growing, see what works. There's a 99% chance it won't work. 
But if you want to go grapes, I would go take a cutting of Valiant and make it happen that way. Can you name a tomato variety that is high in acidity? No, I cannot name a variety high in acidity. I don't, I don't think it makes a whole lot of difference, actually. Can you, I know somebody else here got a comment on that? No, but Tiana Candy has a question for you. Great. What kind of animals will eat in a vegetable garden? <coughs> well, there's a lot of them, and our favorite here in North Dakota are the, our bunny rabbits, uh, which sometimes are mistaken for baby kangaroos. They're so <laughs> okay. Our jack rabbits are one of the biggest enemies of gardeners. You think you're a kid, you think jack rabbit, bunny rabbits are cute and fluffy, but actually, bunny rabbits are evil. They are the enemy. We want to destroy them. It's a battle for the harvest. And so we recommend you got to put up a, well, you use a permanent solution. It's a lead-based product. <laughs> or otherwise, you can put up a print at least 30 inches tall and a couple of inches in the ground. Go after that way. Um, what are your thoughts about wild grapes? Wild grapes. Well, what do you want? What do you know? Okay, what do you like? What is this? Blossford table or something? They thought about wild grapes. Okay, they can be great. They're very vigorous. If they're wild, they're hardy. They can be very useful in jelly jams. Um, they posted Steve's website, our um, information about his gardening Saturday on there. So. so, can you read the URL to the well, I could. Is there everybody's got it? Everyone should have it. Okay, you can just Google Steve's Gardening Saturday. And then if you, if you see if you ever want to go to Bismarck, Cars or Garden Expo, April 11th and 12th. So that's, a, that's another huge event. We have over 25 speeches. And also, I'll give you a heads up. If you kind of like this stuff, we keep a lot of our presentations on a website through Dakota Media Access called freetv.org. Freetv.org. And there's about 20 presentations on gardening there. What else can I do? I'll tell you one other thing I can tell you about. I'll give you a sneak preview across the state. On Saturday, on Saturday, we're going to launch a new program uh, called the uh, Cradle Pirates Program. And what we're doing is we're trying to encourage kids to grow potatoes. Okay, I think it's really fun to grow potatoes with kids because they're like digging for buried treasure, right? Right? And so, and so there's so many surprises that come out of the ground. And so you know, there's, so, you know, there's purple potatoes now, pink, red, gold. There are all kinds of different colors, all kinds of jewels out there. And so, and so this is a free program, and we'll do it just like the variety trial program. We'll do it with two varieties of purple potatoes. And you'll get, you'll get the tuber, the seeds for free, you plant them, and at the end of the year you tell us which one's best. And then you can have some blue or purple french fries. Super cool. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, you're talking about the scab disease. Scab disease. Scab disease. Scab disease. That's what you got in there. Uh, that depends on the variety. Now, the best way to control a scab disease it has to do with watering. From the time that you start seeing the flowers until the next, like for the next month, at least a month or six weeks from flowering to the layer to the layer development, you gotta keep the soil moisture a little bit. You gotta make sure the soil stays moist. That's one of your best ways to control scab disease. If there's a way that you gotta change soil pH, some make it more acid or something that's way too hard for us in North Dakota. Just make sure you, your your potato vines don't get drought stricken after you start seeing some flowers. That's the best way to protect it. It's just superficial, you can just peel off the scabs and still eat them all if you want to, right? There you go. Any other burning questions? How about can you grow vegetables in a tire? I saw that earlier. Yeah, go ahead. Whatever. Doesn't make that not, not toxic. You know, you can put them in stack up the tire, put the soil in. Go for it. Go for it. There was another one with question about how about uh, what uh, what uh, what vegetables do well in a really low spot? And if it's, I would say it's something so low that it would kill, like this person's raspberries. It's really hard to find a vegetable that would really like. 
every vegetable, every vegetable, every vegetable, every vegetable has to have good drainage. That's critical. Right? Otherwise, you know, like grow rice or something. Grow some patty rice. Any other questions out there? Last chance. Yes. Okay, the question has to do with when you're growing vegetables in a container, how do you put what, what, some tips to success with that to make it work? Um, okay, first of all, the more soil in the container, the better. Okay, so get the biggest container you can deal with. And then uh, put in a quality soil, like a potting soil mix, or then if you have topsoil, add a little organic matter to it. This kind of gets to Todd's presentation on container gardening we had earlier. And then certain vegetables do better in containers than others, and usually more uh, dwarf plants do better. Like for tomatoes, we did our, our trials of bush tomatoes last year, bush early girl did especially. Well, um, there's dwarf eggplants, you know, that are cancer and gretel that have been developed. And uh, just kind of think about what's worth your time, too. Because, like, do you really want to plant, like, carrots or peas or corn? It just seems worth it, you know. I would say go get yourself a community garden. That's for me, with containers, what I would do is I would focus a lot. Okay, you can put a couple of tomato plants in. That's cool. How about some herbs? I think that's nice to grow in containers, like on a balcony. That's a nice way to go. You can really get some great, great uh, taste experiences out of herbs. My potato seed has 12-inch sprouts already. Will they grow if I plant them? Should I trim them off? Should I trim off the sprouts? Yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's a, okay. If you heard the question. I'm just trying to delay my response here. Uh, that's kind of a hard one because they're already sprouted. They're already drawing energy out of their their source of food, the tuber itself. So, so if you just pick them off. Uh, I don't know if there's any eyes here that haven't developed yet. The best thing I would do is I would, I would transplant them. I'd, I'd, put them, I'd take this lady's container and I'd plant them right now you know, and just have it sprout, just poking up just slightly near the soil surface. But you know what? It's, uh, you just got, you, there's nothing wrong with just tossing out those potatoes and starting all over. You know, if you got a kid, join our potato pirates project, or you can join our variety trials. We're doing five different types of potatoes. It's kind of, kind of, kind of dicey. Usually, if you're really pushed. I just let it go. I get some new spuds. Yes, sir. Okay. The question was, if I'm going to plant potatoes and I got my seed potatoes. What do I do with it? Leave it whole or should I cut it? And the answer is it depends how big that spud is. If it's a small spud, and sometimes you can buy seed potatoes that are purposely small spuds, so you don't have to cut it. That is the best way because you're not making any wounds. Okay? But if you've got a large if you got a larger tuber, then you should slice them up. You want about I'll say about an inch and a half or Per slice, and of course you got to look at the eyes and make sure you have a viable eye on each of the each of the pieces. A lot of times you'll take a bigger tear and you quarter it. Type of thing. Then I would wait overnight and let it callus over before you stick it in the ground. Yes. Okay, the question is, how about kale, Brussels sprouts, hybrids? You know, a lot of these uh, plants in the, from the brassica family, they're actually the same species. Like cabbage is the exact same thing as Brussels sprouts, which is exactly the same thing as broccoli, which is exactly the same species as cauliflower. And kale might be, I'm not sure if kale is, but they're just different. Uh, they select. They were made selections, human selections for certain aspects of the crop. And so, would a, would a kale, obviously, would a kale or Brussels sprout hybrid work? Okay, if there is such a thing, kale will work and Brussels sprouts will work. So, a kale or Brussels sprout hybrid should work. And, and uh, 
And yeah. you'll be in charge, you know, recommend you know, get it. Find out if you can more about it. I'll tell you about how many days. Kale is usually about 50 to 60 days. Brussels sprouts are 90 to 100 days. So both, so both will work, but in any case, I probably wait until after the first hard frost before I start picking. Because kale and Brussels sprouts both have kind of a sharp edge to them. So wait until the frost comes before you harvest them. And kale, you can pick kale all the way. That's near Christmas, you, know, you can't kill kale for anybody, even if you want, if you want it. Yeah. That's right. That's what he talks about for, for leafy vegetables. If you can harvest them on a regular basis, that's right. You keep picking the outer leaves, and it keeps generating new leaves at the crown of the plant. That's right. You can keep it going. That's the way. That's the best way to do it. If you're out, that's the best way to do it to, to extend your harvest. Yeah, you're right on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, cabbage loopers love kale. Cabbage loopers, like all members of the cabbage family, so be vigilant. So when you start seeing the white moss flying, that's you know they're they're just not hanging out there for no reason. They're laying their eggs, and you should be ready to go after them. With whatever strategy you got. Two strategies I can think of. One is the, the thinking person strategy, like use BT products, Bacillus thuringiensis, like Dipel or Thuricide. They are perfectly safe, so you can spray them and even harvest the next day, but they will only kill the young, the young loopers in our case, or caterpillars. Okay, but they're perfectly safe to use. On the other hand, some people, especially when they start seeing holes in their leaves, they just, they will really, they're so mad about it, they just don't want to, you know what, if that BT takes a couple of days to work, then that doesn't work for some people. It's, I call them the dirty, hairy, Clint Eastwood gardeners, who say, make my day, I want revenge. And so what we do is we get a product like Carbril or Seven, and you can spray them, and if it makes it just right, you can watch those loopers go through convulsions and die right before your eyes. It's a beautiful sight, and it's a revenge. But you got to use that that weapon with caution. It's very deadly, right? Right? More than one way to handle. There's organic. They're safe. And some organic options are not especially safe too. Just because it's organic doesn't mean it's safe. You read the label carefully. Whatever product you use. Any other questions, Tom? Before we call it a forum. Okay. Another question here. Okay, what's the best way to deal with Colorado potato beetles? Okay. Okay. So first of all, the key is you got to find them early on, right? And so what you do is you can be scouting for them, and you'll see little orange eggs on the leaf underside. And when you see those orange eggs, then you just can rub them. And you've got it under control. The other thing is, like, if you've got two little kids, you can pay them by the bucket. And you can just, the first, the Kyle Potato Beetle will be a soft, gelatinous, uh, nymph is a word. It's an immature stage. And then it becomes a hard shell beetle that strike the beetle later. You can pick them off. Um, otherwise, there are some uh, chemical insecticides that can be effective, especially if you get them when they're early. Um, Carburil has some mixed results with that. There's strains of BT that are effective against Colorado potato beetle, so look for that. There's strains of Bacillus thuringiensis that can be used. But you gotta get them early, and they're still a soft body. Yeah, that's a hard one. 